Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Actually, what we are going to do in the, in the last lecture, what we did was to basically look at the emerging markets and what are the characteristics of innovation in emerging markets. In other words, the products and services that you basically produce in emer emerging markets and if you want to market it to the people, what should be the kind of characteristics it should have. And what is the use of this ecosystem framework? If you want to, how is it useful in coevolution and in convergence of making a, uh, a, a, and creating blockbuster industries? So, there are several industries which can be highly useful to the emerging market people as well as it can create blockbuster industries. For example, they include food security. In other words, food security is providing nutritious food to all the people. There are lots of poor people in the emerging markets, billions. And if you produce food at accessible points and at affordable prices, which is nutritious, which meaning not only grains, but it has vitamins, all the minerals and other things that are needed for healthy uh, healthy humans. So then you are basically reducing the disease, disease burden and you are making the world more livable place. So the food security is one of the things where uh, we are going to consider this in this course of lectures, how to create uh, uh, using the ecosystem because food is, is one thing which is highly government controlled, which is necessarily so, and is also delivery is important. Uh, uh, in a place where it should not be adulterated, it has to be hygienic and also there are a lot of resources that are needed, land, water and the so-called agriculture mm -hmm. and also the small scale industries and so on. So it is a combination of all the three sectors of the economy which uses all the resources water, power, finance and the human resources. So the food security is one of the important issues that one need to consider. So it is such issues like power, water and food, they will become blockbuster industries if done properly and a lot of attention has not been given to these sectors so far. So let us look at each of this and let us look at the supply chain and how to redesign the supply chain. Yeah. For example, in terms of product innovation, we are talking Hyundai customized small car Santro to suit Indian market with 90% local components. Well, is it innovation? Certainly it is innovation because from a big car to small car to suit the market conditions, the roads, the poor condition of the roads and so on and also source so that it is locally acceptable local components, 90% of the components from local companies is an issue. Well, Nano, for example, which is produced by Tata, uh, is a fuel efficient 1 lakh car. 1 lakh is basically, uh, in those days it is equivalent to 2500, but now it is less than $2,000. And it is a car which is fuel efficient as well as um, a very cheap car. So basically this was innovations because uh, we are going to look at it, what Tata's have to go through to create a particular car of this. Cummins produces diesel engines and power generators for small retailers, regional hospitals and farmers. So these are because the, uh, the power generation is important, everybody has their own generators. Uh, particularly if you are a small retailer and also in hospitals because you cannot go without power, but power security is not very good in countries like India. So basically that's where Cummings has come in to the needs of the locals of providing cheap diesel engines and power generators 
diesel and for small retailers houses and so on and of course the another one that is frequently talked about is general electric has done in the healthcare division thousand dollar handheld electrocardiogram it's a device and a portable fifteen thousand dollar pc based ultrasound machine so these ultrasound machines and others they used to be very huge so what uh, these people have done is to invent these things uh, the cardio electrocardiogram as well as the ultrasound machines and they they were basically there is the innovation blowback they are originally developed for in a way emerging markets like ECG device for rural India and ultrasound machine for rural China but now they are being sold in the US pioneering new uses of such machines now for example in the in the hospital uh, where surgeries are going on if they want to have uh, these things it's they're easily locatable in the in the surgery place instead of having in the diagnostic centers so basically the the, the new products that that have come out from the emerging markets both in healthcare in in auto as well as in in power sectors have been phenomenal and nano is a great example of a blue ocean strategy. There are two kinds of strategies. So one is the blue ocean strategy, another one is the red ocean strategy. We'll talk about it in the next slide. The uh, nano, this nano is an innovator of multiple levels from engineering to marketing to manufacturing. The idea is to produce a car that is affordable in amateur markets. And this is the, this is the car that uh, is there and there is Ratan Tata standing by it, who is the owner of uh, the Tatas and it, ha that has, it has to be produced in 1 lakh of Indian rupees which is less than $2,000 today. Now how do you produce a car which costs several thousands of dollars in less than $2,000? So it requires cheaper components but high quality. It requires uh, multiple levels of coordination, marketing and so on. So basically all this was achieved. Tata's collaborated with the suppliers like Bosch and Delphi in early stages of design, challenging them to be full partners in the nano innovation by developing low cost components. And Tata's plan to build the Nano as a kit. They originally planned to to, uh, to build Nano as a kit, shipping parts of local business to a local business for assembly. The assembly now happens in the plant, and the full vehicles are transported by transport. So transport costs costs a lot of money. It costs seven percent of the cost of the of the of the vehicle. So if you want to save ever on everything. So what you have to do is you may have to want to ship the parts as a kit. You know this is one of the innovations that no automobile has think of, thought of earlier. Although they have not done it already, but they basically wanted to make it as a kit so that they can send the kit by trucks to the uh, uh, to the dealers, and dealer can assemble and uh, uh, give the car. Uh, to the purchasers. So this significantly lowers starters capital costs and the company does not need to build lots of assembly plants or hire a train workers and take responsibility for shipping of the final product and so on. So although this has not happened, I mean this is one of the plans that uh, Tata's had which is highly innovative one instead of sending a product which is fully assembled, the final product. You assemble the sub you send the sub assemblies for basically they can be assembled in a local dealership shop. So the nano shows the a new world order is possible in auto industry. It shows a glimpse of what is to come. In other words, the, the auto industry is 100, 100 years old and over the time it has the doors, it has an engine, it has nothing significant, these things happened, although efficiency has increased. So nano is the first example where people have thought of several innovations in actually manufacturing the car. So what are red and blue in ocean strategies? Markets are made of uh, both red and blue innovation strategies. What is red? The red ocean represents known market space. 
it is a known market space in other words whatever existing market where all industries currently exist. In this space the potential for profits growth decrease as the market becomes congested and companies try to outperform each other. So how do you in a red this one where if you have a lot of a uh, lot of cars there is a lot of market uh, for either cell phones or cars or whatever and if you want to enter your other player. So in a congested marketplace how do you outperform? So you give discounts, you give dealers, you sell services and stuff products. So there are several things that people do but that is the red ocean strategy. Blue oceans are untapped market spaces, opportunities for highly profitable growth by opening up a larger pie that is new demand creation. So you have a new demand that is created, how do you create a new demand? In other words, if you have telephone market, landline market, you have opened a cell phone market, wireless, then you have created a new demand for this. Then you have ordinary cell phone which is used for just speaking to each other. But on the other hand now you could do several things using the cell phone. So cell phone is becoming a part of life. So you are basically expanding the horizon so you are increasing the demand. And once you increase the demand you have a cell phone basically giving voice and now you create a cell phone with to, to get your emails, get your this one. So basically you are differentiating yourself and to a larger pie. And so that is where it becomes another way of getting profitable is the basically the car or automobile is supposed to be a middle class vehicle. If you want to get target those people who have motorbikes, so you should be you should be make it affordable and price it almost like a motorbike or twice that. So that's what Tata's have done in terms of pricing. And that has created them uh, following the blue air strategy companies have shift productivity frontier outwards by reconstructing market boundaries to create bigger economic pie. How do you create more economic pie? Another this one that the economic pie has been created is in terms of the cell phone market. Reliance when it started it asked one simple question. If you are starting a a cell phone company and how do you estimate the market? The market is basically consists of the landlines in those days. So you can say if you go to a marketing specialist he will say only half of you can estimate the market saying that half the landline users will be using that and half of them who are going to going out often they they cannot use the landline so they go to the cell loans and so on. So you will get as much as the landline market. But on the other hand if you want to create an economic pie, a lot bigger pie you can ask the question how big can I make the market. Now how can I make the uh, market this one can I make it affordable to people. Everybody can speak. Now people are using the they, are, they, they don't communicate they use the letters there and so on. So can I make a telephone call as cheap as a letter as a postcard. So if you want to increase your market size to make it a bigger economic pie. So what you should do is how much what is the market that I can make is what is the what are the barriers for for making it an economic pie is it the cost is it the instrument. So can I make those instruments which are cheaper. And can I make the call rates cheaper so that I can get this one. So you can see that the Indian telephone market which is the, the tele density now is almost like 80 percent. That means 80 percent of the people of 1.2 billion people have a cell phone. So this is unimaginable in without the kind of thinking that the people has. So one thing is deregulation by companies, by the countries. Another thing is having visionary companies, partners who basically have used follow the so called blue, uh, blue ocean strategies to gain the market. 
and you know, this is the, what I am talking about the pricing of the product. Tata did set the price for nano by calculating the cost of production and adding the margin. Usually if you are uh, uh, pricing a product how do you price it? You say cost of production plus add the margin 10 percent, 15 percent to various stakeholders and so on. That is how that is how you get into get into the total price. But on the other hand you set up the price as 2500 dollars as 1 lakh and then then work back with the help of the partners to build a 2500 dollar clock that would reward all involved with a small profit. Now you are not giving anything free. So when you are giving 2500 you should still make profit but how do you actually do that? So that is the point that is where they collaborated with to make cheaper components and so on. So basically they were thinking uh, where are the cost elements and how do I change it and what are the new things that new procedures, new business models I should follow. So they you take the ecosystem, you have this nano this one, you take the ecosystem, look at the resources, look at the government policies, look at the labor this one and look at the, the delivery mechanisms, where are the costs involved and how do I change it and how do I reduce those costs to make it a $2500 cost. So that is the kind of uh, uh, thinking that you should have in terms of in making it a blue ocean strategy and blue ocean strategies are very important in amateur markets because the economic pie is the market is very huge, but people cannot pay the price. So there is scale that is available. So how do you use that scale to, to uh, get to the market? So this is, this is how uh, uh, people have to think and do it, do the pricing properly. For example, there are satches available the shampoos, uh, the soaps, uh, the and other, and other things which are available as in small packets rather than in big bottles. So people may, may not have the money to buy big bottles of shampoos and, and body washes and so on. But when they, they, they basically whenever it requires they pay a small amount and get a sachi, use it and, and throw it. So that is basically the pricing of the product in terms of scale. So people have to see how, how to get it, get to the reach in the, into this. So this example is a, is a very important one in terms of the emerging markets, how to price a particular product. Well, the, with the start of nano and several other things, and also the climate change, the greenhouse gases and the transportation basically uh, 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 contributes about 18 percent of the greenhouse, greenhouse gases. So and the volatile prices of oil has made automakers well on seek alternatives to petroleum fueled powertrains. So the engines that you use in the automobile are petroleum fuel. Now how do I change this trend? because the oil has becoming expensive and oil is becoming the oil resources are becoming uh, the, the becoming scarce. So because of all these factors is it possible to reduce the one thing is to reduce the, the use of automobiles and second thing is to find alternate means of powering these things. So there are car, car models which are being introduced and it depends on the condition for example, in China they want to use electric cars that is because they are struggling to reduce the air pollution. Air pollution not only because of the cars transportation increase and the middle class they can afford the cars so that has more greenhouse gases and so on and the second thing is there are more industrialization and that is creating uh, problems in China. So basically there are several cities in China which has basically had this pollution. So the best solution there is to get to the electric cars that so they have, are interested in power generation to 
and also battery companies which will uh, to, to basically which to power the uh, the automobiles ethanol in sugarcane rich brazil and brazil is as a uh, is a country with uh, with agriculture and uh, it has basically highly productive uh, agriculture and there is sugar care rich this one so they want to use biofuels ethanol to basically drive the cars so diesel in oil rich russia so i mean i am mentioning only a few countries depending on this you have to each country has to decide whether it is hybrid car whether it's a gas driven car whether it's oil car whether it is uh, uh, diesel petrol or electric or whatever or some other uh, means of driving the car so this is where the car models are being innovated and so on that's and the other one is the product and service innovation second one is the business model innovation this is another thing that the supply chains need to follow business model innovation is reconfiguration of activities in the existing business model of a firm that is new to the product or service markets in which firm competes so the firm is competes in you know, this one and what is the so to gain an advantage can you follow a dif different business model there are several uh, companies which follow the business models business model innovation actually involves it can in involve importing business models from one product service market to another in other words you need not have to uh, it it is new for that vertical but you could have followed from another vertical for example southwest airlines is one of the cheap airlines after the liberalization southwest airlines it's borrowed, borrowed a business model from interstate bus transport and apply it to the airline industry in other words in southwest airlines you can book a ticket online when you go there they they will there is no seat allotment so first in first served so you can go into the aircraft and take any any seat there and uh, the, the everything else is outsourced you have to pay if uh, you have check in baggage you are encouraged to uh, to travel light and and so on so there is no uh, they don't own uh, any of the infrastructure in the airlines and they they don't they have minimum amount of staff and uh, there is the except the pilot and nobody else and they don't serve any meals or etc inside the aircraft so probably they'll give you water so that's the kind of thing that a uh, business model and uh, once uh, it is a direct flight from one place to the other and when so this is like uh, uh, interstate bus transportation and mcdonald's brought tension assembly line techniques to the fast food, fast food business if you go to mcdonald's what happens you go there and pay the money and whatever you have ordered it will be flashed on to the kitchen and they will assemble it and they have a menu so you can order only from the menu and they have the standard projects the products and depending on what the product is they will just heat it up and then or if it is french fries they will fry it uh, fresh and then give it to you in standardized boxes everything is standardized including the outfit where the mcdonald is this one so xerox does not sell copying machines so if you want uh, xerox uh, uh this one but installs and maintains copying machines in offices and charges per page basis so it is providing solutions rather than products so this is this is one of the things that this one if you buy a a, a copying machine you know you have to buy all the uh, uh things like the paper uh, the cartridge uh, the ink and other things and also you may have to maintain it uh, this one and the maintenance expenditure could be large but instead of all this xerox all this does all this for you and you have to pay a minimum minimum charge plus per page charges so for each page you pay so this is this is very convenient if there is a new xerox machine 
that has come with a new technology, then you can always replace it by free. So there are several innovations that uh, Xerox had done in this. And power by the either, if you travel by the air, air, aircraft, aircraft engines are not owned by the aircraft owners. Aircraft engines are paid for the number of hours they are in the flying aircraft. If the aircraft is not flying, then they do not get any money. This is called power by the hour. So that is the kind of service business models that uh, people follow. So these innovations depending on the vertical you have, you can innovate your own models. For example, uh, instead of uh, selling a product through uh, the retailers, you can sell direct. That is an innovation that uh, you can follow. So there are several innovations that in terms of their business models that you follow. Another uh, company I would just want to mention is Samax. Samax is a Mexico based company and uh, it, is, it became the fourth largest uh, cement company in the world. And what their CEO said in 2001 is we need to supply not only cement but also a broad range of other building materials, leveraging our world class logistics distribution capabilities to help our customers succeed. So what they are saying is, you know, cement by itself does not add any value. It is used in construction and for construction you require other materials along with the cement. So you require steel, you require uh, 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 other sand, you require other materials to or make uh, to use this, to mix it and use this. So why not we become a building materials company? And the idea is our customers this one. So let us do whatever our customers want. In other words, if some customer is building an air airport and cement is only a small portion of whatever they spend, but you help the customer in terms of procurement of all the materials that are needed which is steel, which is cement, which is the gravel and other kinds of things and also you uh, help him in architecting the, uh, the airport. The architecture also becomes uh, a, a part of your this one. So when if you do all this then your cement becomes incidental because cement is only a very small part of your uh, this one. So that is how this one. Who are all the customers of Cemex? Yeah, distributors. They sell cement. So for the distributors of, of cement or basically distributors for uh, the household materials or building materials. There is like steel, like gravel, like sand and other kinds of things. So you help your distributors to get steel. So what happens if you go to a steel company and you say I am buying on behalf of all these distributors, all these small holders, all these large infrastructures, builders and so on. So similar the, the steel company is going to give you at a discount and it is going to give you high quality this one. It is going to deliver to your distributor sites. So your distributors, small house builders, small house builders they require cement all right, they require other materials and more importantly they require finance. So can you provide finance or help them get finance through microfinance organizations and so on. So ready mix concrete dealers, value added transformation companies like slabs, prefabricated complex deals and large infrastructure companies, the airports, roads, housing complexes, etc. So you find out what the customer wants, make a list and use your influence, use your connections with all those people, with all the uh, dealers, all the manufacturers and all that so that all these people are successful. So that is what Samex does. So Samex works with its customers and provides solutions which require expertise much beyond manufacture of cement. Well, if you want to do all the things that I have just said, then it is not just 
same x but sum x gets the uh, four or five times the cement this one uh, if you when they buy uh, gravel when they buy steel and other kinds of things so their working capital their working uh, this one menu is four times that of cement so basically they make lot of profit and also they become very popular in terms of uh, in terms of the distributors and so on and they become basically highly connected to all the stakeholders in the industry and that is enough to sell the cement. So selling the cement from Sabax is just incidental. So that's what we have seen in terms of when you are talking of product and supply chain. So what matters are just not the product and the services. It also matters the business models. You want to innovate so that you could you could get uh, uh, more connections. You can get more. You offer more services to the this one. But of course, I mean it involves a lot of work. When you are having, uh, for example, for Samex, uh, if you are offering to all these all the all your customers to the distributors a variety of services, well, it involves a lot of work. But it also gives you more profits. So it also expands your horizon. You know, one thing is to increase your cement plant capacity. Go to global and establish this one. Another way of expansion is get into the services which use the cement and expand into them, which probably is much more profitable than say, just selling the cement. So one has to think carefully about the product service innovations that are possible. So the second thing that we are going to look at is the innovations in the delivery service. Let us look at the logistics. One of the things that, uh, oh God. So let us look at the telecom uh, or logistics one thing. is that I think I have the wrong slide. So here uh, this is just the logistics service chain. You have the manufacturers, infrastructure providers, network operators, voice and dot this one. I have to replace this slide. So you have the uh, the resources, the institutions and uh, this one. So what are the innovations in logistics? So in terms of product and service innovation, you have containerization, transshipment, supply hubs, cross docking, outsourcing, modularization, standardization and so on. And of course, you have packaging, late customization, merge in transit, customs, sensor networks for visibility. These are all the product service this one. In terms of regulations, you have basically in transportation, you are worried about green because transportation contributes to 18 percent of the green gas gases across the world. You have to worry about customs because you are crossing continents and you have to worry about trade, you have to worry about the knowledge. You have to know about both the countries uh, where your uh, your shipping is is connected. You should have connections with the government, with the authorities, with the companies. You have foreign exchange. You should worry about foreign exchange of this, and also free trade agreements and trade facilitation. So actually, if you are a logistics company, then you should be able to help your customers uh, in terms of. Uh, their foreign exchange as well as the others. So basically it is not just transporting, it is basically providing other services like telling the detailed knowledge of this. And also they are connecting services and technologies like uh, there is the, uh, the like RFID, uh, then radio frequency uh, uh, devices, GPS, uh, 3 PLs, 4 PLs, data integration and mining remote monitoring and execution, IT services and cloud. They are basically both logistics and, uh, and IT service execution. As we have seen in case of um, remote monitoring and execution using BPOs, it becomes uh, a very uh, big issue for logistics companies because when you are crossing continents, your container may be sitting in, in a port and you may not know about it. So basically, if you have RFID tags or, or sensor networks, you can enable them using GPS 
and using remote monitoring you can know where your containers are and appropriate, take appropriate action to speed their delivery to the customers and so on. Of course, there are resources and management, there are innovations like training and HR approaches, uh, efficient operations with poor industry inputs. This is one thing that where lots of innovations are this one. People may complain that there are no roads or there are poor roads and people may complain that it is there is the, uh, the there is no truck one full truck load that's available. So I cannot transfer it. I can transfer only once in month and the goods have to wait till I get a full truck load and so on. So but in such cases is it possible to transfer goods via the passenger buses or passenger vehicles. What I mean is 80 percent of air freight travels through passenger aircraft, 80 percent. So there are only companies like FedEx who will just use this for freight, freight of this express delivery of letters and so on. But most of the freight it travels through passenger aircraft. Is it possible to replicate that in the uh, bus industry? If you have a bus that is passenger bus that takes people from anywhere to anywhere, say from a state headquarters to a village, is it possible to have uh, to load some freight into that which is destined to that village and can it be delivered to the post office and the customer can, can collect it from the post office and post office takes the responsibility because it knows the, all the customers in the village and there are 136,000 post offices in India. Almost every village has a post office. So use the existing service instead of trying to tell people that you want to have the very efficient industry inputs. I do not have roads, I want to have a truck services and so on. Instead of that you want to use with the existing inputs can you use this. And of course supply chain finance is another, another issue that uh, uh, is of importance and innovative governance models. So they are all used for the resources and management in the large industry. And there is uh, this in terms of delivery there are also disruptions which are catalyzed by cloud. You know the cloud computing is one thing that is coming uh, in a big way in uh, uh, into the industry. This growth of cloud delivery models helped startups to follow pay per use model rather than buying, installing and maintaining servers. Uh, if you are a small company you have several <coughs> employees and they have all their computers. <coughs> you have to communicate, share, store all your data at some place and maintain it, forward it. It can be financial, industrial data and so you have to basically buy, install and maintain all the servers. So that becomes uh, a capital intensive work. So instead of that if there is the there somebody maintains these services and you just rent them and you follow what is called per use model. So depending on the GB of data stored and how long they are stored and other services that you require you are charged. So as I said before this is like uh, you know you are charged for the warehouse space you are using or uh, you are charged uh, for if you are traveling on a bus you are charged for your seat not for the bus and so on. So the new cloud architecture can address the needs of orchestrators trying to manage loosely coupled networks. Now one thing that, that happens here is there are several small scale industries all over the world and they contribute to the production but the small scale industries do they have the capability to maintain all the SRP, ERP systems? So ERP systems are now going on to the cloud where several SMEs can basically use the, the ERP, SAP and other and Oracle uh, software systems to, uh, to manage their uh, this one. Supposing you have a several such SMEs 
like an aperol or in small uh, toys this one uh, in several of these small scale industries. And supposing one wants to manage all this, in other words they have their individual uh, uh, cloud databases stored inside the cloud, but can somebody orchestrate these loosely coupled network partners and basically take them, integrate them into the global value chain. So, it is now possible using a new cloud architecture that is because integrating and them into the global value chain and selling it to the big partners in the, the in the network it requires lot of information exchange and that is possible through the cloud because everybody is a small player here and they cannot afford to have the kind of cloud delivery models that are required. So, the delivery models that are required by, by themselves. So, they can use the cloud to orchestrate to or to manage this loosely coupled network. Uh, so, it becomes an enabler a very important enabler for orchestration of small SMEs into the global value chain networks. And finally, there are industries like healthcare, finance, education who get disrupted by the cloud. What I mean is supposing in the healthcare there is the stock of patient records. Now, these patient records they can be accessible from the cloud of course, with a password access. So, today the patient records is in the hands of books or maybe it is on scanned and put somewhere uh, this one and you require the patient's permission, the hospital permission and the government permission to access the records very rightly so. But still with all these permissions once I have these permissions is it possible to access these patient records in an emergency if the patient is undergoing a surgery and there is something that is required and so on. And is it possible when the patient shifts hospitals say from emergency hospital to uh, to a franchise hospital near his house. Is it possible the doctors access instead of the patient carrying uh, these handwritten records which are sometimes illegible and unreadable. So, the, the patient records the digital patient records basically they standardize or they are more readable and they are more standardized vocabulary. So, that every doctor can understand what is written and what is the idea behind the treatments and so on. So, you can this these disruptions can be catalyzed by the cloud services. So, the delivery service is is creating lot of innovations like cloud is creating lot of innovations in lot of industries and so on. So, this cloud is like like it has become like uh, like making the internet accessible or the not only internet services, but other services like data storage and data access accessible to small players. So, cyber security and breach of trust are big issues here. In other words, when you are talking of cloud, you are believing in a third party and you are storing all your data there. So, either there is a there could be a breach of trust or there is somebody can hack into the, the cloud and there is the cyber security. The, they are the big issues which are for uh, uh, the cloud. Another big thing that is happening in the, the in recent times in the delivery issues is the big data. Nowadays, big data is, is, is something which uh, 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 very popular in terms of and it is causing disruptive changes in retailing. So, what is that a retailer want? It wants to understand the customer retail, customer behavior. It wants to have on its shelves what the customer really wants at that point in time and it wants to understand the customer behavior. So, how do you get this? You, you can get all this by surveys, but surveys are becoming very unpopular because the customers may not take it very serious. So, how shoppers move around their stores, where they go, in what order, how long they stay, when they come to the store and how will all these questions map onto actual sales. So, now you may go and visit some place, 
touch the product, go to the lick at it, go the other some, something and then finally do not may not buy it. So, are you there to find out what is the price? Are you there to find out whether it is useful to you or something? And how, what is that you are actually buying? So, you want to understand customer behavior once he enters the retail store. Retailers are developing predictive models for price discounting, advertising and coupon. In other words, if you buy something repeatedly from the, your POS data, point of sale data, is it possible to analyze which you either pay through a credit card or, or whatever. So, is it possible to identify you with what you are buying if you are frequently buying something? Is it possible you can announce saying that if you buy two then I get price discounting or advertising for products. If you are look, if you go and look at uh, uh, some cell phones or something can you advertise we have a new cell phone coming up next week and it has these features and so on and you say we can we have coupons uh, you know which are getting issued next we have going to have a sale uh, next week and so on. So, basically you can send all this information. Forecasting based on past data batch size calculation using square root formulas are being replaced by real time visibility and delivery and demand. So, you can see a big shift in terms of the, uh, the how retailers are looking at this. In earlier what you used to do you have to do forecasting based on last month's data, last month's sales and so on and use the square root formula how much inventory you want to have and all that. But now it is all real time visibility and delivery on demand. So, for example, Walmart has a technology program tax connections between people, products, brands and users to, to make product recommendations to customers. Well, if you can basically uh, if you have a cell phone you will get recommendations when you are in this inside the store you will get the recommendations what depending on what uh, label you are looking at. So, you will get recommendations. So, Walmart aggregates and mines POS data point of sale data to predict customer buying behavior and links inventory and purchasing data with the suppliers to speed inventory terms and lower holding, holding costs. So, they want to have only what the customers are buying. They do not want to have anything anything else in this. So, depending on so it is the customer behavior and the buying behavior the data it is not the last month sales it is the current behavior of the customer what the customer wants today now is the one that matters. So, that is the kind of disruption that is happening. And of course, there is a company called Netflix which sells uh, movies and it has a recommendation system for each subscriber from their viewing habits using sophisticated algorithms. In other words, if you are downloading a movie for viewing, well depending on what you download whether it is Hollywood movies or Bollywood movies whatever and uh, uh, depending on that. You, they will make recommendations of what are the new things that are that are available. So, it requires algorithmic sophistication and so on. So, there is one thing Target is a is a company predicted pregnancy in a teen based on her buying patterns. So, in other words there there is this is it possible to find out what the the human being is going through if if you are buying say vitamin enriched. Uh, the mineral enriched or zinc enriched vitamins. Then why are you buying if you are a lady then is it a pregnancy do you have doctors this one. So, there are several questions which which they can they can answer depending on your buying behavior what you are buying. So, of course, there is this could be there is a privacy issues involved in all this. So, people you may think that nobody is watching you in your when you are in a retail store, but you have to be careful because the, there is a big data and the algorithms behind and they are watching you when, when disruptive retailing. So, in the delivery mechanism it is not just delivery of the products, it is the your behavior that is basically is important to the retailers and big data is doing big runs 
in the in getting disruptive changes in retailing. So, there is an explosion of data. Uh, what was once stuff of science fiction has become an everyday occurrence, extra bytes, jetta bytes, error eta bytes, sensors, asset intelligence, mobile devices, constant streams of unstructured communications have created digital exhaust that can capture who we are, how we live and work and play. That is basically it. So, driven by computer algorithms, recommenders help consumers selecting products they will probably like and might buy based on browsing, searches, purchases and preferences. So, nothing confidential anymore. If you are on the internet, then you are known to the entire world. So, basically there is a big data explosion that is happening. And there are basically several trends in terms of the governance that is happening in the recently. People used to own all the assets. So, now people are saying do not own all assets, you orchestrate. It is a new mantra in business. Li and Fang does not own any factories, but orchestrates network of 15,000 suppliers and 29,000 employees in 10 in 40 countries supplying goods to well known consumer brands. And Boeing has 77 jet assemblage of 3 million parts for more than 900 suppliers in 17 countries. Southwest, they do not, they only have core branding and the concept of airline, but put together operations out to bid. They leave engines, they lease engines and aircraft, contracted out baggage handling and maintenance. And similarly, logistics providers, the fourth party logistics providers, they basically orchestrate the movement of material from one place to another. So, there is a recent trend in terms of the governance as well. So, you have an orchestrator and you have the client and from client gives you the design and it basically it gets to the orchestrator and material sourcing, factories, quality control and logistics and everything is done by the orchestrator and finally delivered to the client. So, this is the kind of uh, governance mechanisms that are ba basically coming into the future. So, we have innovations in terms of resources, the IT resources or search engines, wireless communications and internet are the biggest innovations of recent times. Google, Yahoo and several others have become household names. Their convenience created online libraries, Wikipedia, online markets, online deliveries of digital products, advertising, working from home, video conferencing, interconnected camera system for security, cloud computing, all the IT innovations that have come. Cell phones or devices using you can using which you can access all the above facilities from anywhere anytime. So, basically the IT resources innovations are, are great this one. And you have the supply chain clusters which are created uh, where uh, uh, you have the, the clusters which has inbound transportation raw materials manufacturers to outbound transportation distribution delivery and so on. So, you could keep at one place highly connected all the people through information flow infra infrastructure. So, that becomes a supply chain cluster for a particular product. They need not have to be co-located, co they can be co-located at one place, but the competitive advantage comes in if they are globally co located, they are globally located as well as and they are connected informationally and financially and then goods flow is manipulated then you have a, a competitive advantage. This is one of the big things that has happened in the delivery service, uh, the, in the resources this one. Of course, we have seen the, the resources of uh, clusters. I have went through this particular California wine cluster. You have growers, you have wineries and this is the supply chain here and you have uh, the uh, the resources, uh, uh, the uh, the delivery mechanisms, and also uh, 
the uh, the equipment, the barrels, and so on in terms of the delivery, all are and the educational institutions and these institutions, the state governments and other agencies that will respond. So this basically provides in the terminology of a wine cluster the supply chain ecosystem of this. California has become a significant player in the wine industry with this. So that is the innovations and the role of uh, the governors. We will do that uh, next time.